ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय After eating, you should not go out to the street without having washed your mouth, hands and feet. You should not go out in the evening or with the hair loose, nor should you go out unless you are properly decorated with ornaments. You should not leave the home unless you are very grave and are sufficiently covered. Purpled by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada. Kashyapa Muni advised his wife not to go out into the street unless she was well decorated and well dressed. He did not encourage the mini skirts that have now become fashionable. In Oriental civilization, when a woman goes into the street, she must be fully covered so that no man will recognize who she is. All these methods are to be accepted for purification. One takes to Krishna consciousness, one is fully purified, and thus one remains always transcendental to the contamination of the material world. Om Ajnana Timanandasya Ajnana Anjana Shalakya Chakshan Malitaniyana Tasmai Shri Guravina Maha Shri Chaitanya Manavistam Sakitamina Bhutale Soyam Rupakadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Uttapadakam Nan Shri Guru Vaishnavanashtha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raguna Tanvitam Tham Sadevam Sadvetam Savadhutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakhanatam Shri He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Tope Sadhopi Kakanta Radha Kanta Namaskite Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vishavana Sute Devi Panamani Hari Dhyaya Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nishananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shiva Shari Gaurava Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Notice thus prashta salila, sandhya yam mukta murdhaja, anachita samyita vak, na samyita by his charat. So Kashyapa Muni is continuing to instruct his wife, uh, Deepi, as we have read. Yeah, in this section, we've already discussed this, how Devi was very really aggrieved because two of her sons were killed. And she had a desire to have a son who would be able to take revenge. Kashyapa Muni, however, was not really happy with this desire of, of his wife. So his wife was trying his best to please him. So Kashyapa Muni told his wife you know, that if she is able to follow the guidelines which he is giving her very strictly, then she would be able to have a son who would be able to kill Indra. But if she deviated from the vow, then she would have a friend, she would have a son who would become friendly to her. Indra. So we see in these verses that Kashyapa Muni is giving very valuable instruction regarding how one should become a Vaishnava. For example, Kashyapa Muni pointed out how she must become truthful and how she should not curse anyone at all. So Prabhupada explains this tendency, tendency to curse others a result of being envious in nature. Generally in the material world, everyone is envious of everyone else. 
This is materialistic society. We divide society into friends and enemies. We identify certain group of individuals to be our friends and certain people to be our enemies. And we make all our plans how we can please our friends and harm our enemies. So in spiritual life, however, that is not our standard or guideline. Just like when Pallad Maharaj's father, Hinani Kashipu, was instructing his teachers to train his son in the art of diplomacy. Diplomacy means divide and rule, friends and enemies. Pallad totally rejected that advice. Surdam Sarva Dahina, a devotee of the Lord, is a friend of everyone. So Pallad said, I really have no enemy. So I'm not really interested in this philosophy of the, being diplomatic, of having friends and enemies. Then a devotee is also not envious of anyone because as Lord Chaitanya revealed to a moga, the son-in-law of Sarvama Bhattacharya, as long as you have envy in your heart, Krishna will refuse to reside in your heart. Of course, Krishna is residing the heart of everyone, even the non-devotee. Even Krishna is so kind that even when we take on the body of an animal, Krishna still keeps us company by residing in the form of Paramatma. But Krishna will not reciprocate with us unless we really surrender to his plans, to his instructions. So this Amoga, he was the son-in-law of Sarvabhama Bhattacharya. Sarvabhama Bhattacharya was actually a very great Sanskrit scholar who originally hailed from Nabadvip. But because at that time there was a Bengal had fallen under Muslim rule, Sarvabhama Bhattacharya had to leave Bengal and then he came and took shelter of Jagannath Puri. But he was of course a staunch impersonalist, very great Sanskrit scholar, but a Mayavadi. And his brother-in-law Gopinath Acharya would always glorify Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, but then Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is non different from Krishna. Sarvabhata Acharya had trouble in accepting Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as God. However, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mercy fell upon him in many ways. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he came to Jagannath Puri, he saw Lord Jagannath. And as soon as he saw Lord Jagannath, he fainted in ecstasy. And the gatekeeper and the other attendants of the Jagannath Puri temple were not really sure if Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was still alive. Then they put a cotton and they saw that he was still breathing. Anyway, then he was carried to Sarvamavadacharya's house. And there he was finally, he came out of his ecstatic uh, mood when Nityananda came there with that kirtan. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu eventually revealed his transcendental form to Sarvamavadacharya. Sarvamavadacharya had asked Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to listen to his commentary on the Vedanta. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu very patiently heard it, but he did not even utter one word. Eight days, seven days, he did not have one word. Then finally when Sarvamavadacharya asked him, are you understanding something? Why are you not saying anything? Then Chaitanya Mahaprabhu spoke. And he pointed out how Sarvamavadacharya was misrepresenting the message of the Vedanta. So Sarvamavadacharya was fully convinced uh, after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu spoke and revealed his transcendental form that he is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But he had one daughter. He only had one daughter, one child. And that daughter was married to a Moga, who was very envious of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's exalted position. It is not that even, even when the Lord appears, there are some people who are envious, isn't it? Just like when Krishna was on the planet, in the Rajasuya sacrifice, when all the great sages were glorifying Krishna, Sishipala got up and started criticizing the Lord. So there are always people who are envious of the Lord. So Amoga 
We had trouble in accepting Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's supreme position. And on one occasion, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was in Jagannath Puri, whenever Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would travel and visit different places, he would be invited by different householders to come and have prasad in their house. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was eating prasad a few days in Sarvabhavanacharya's house, and whenever his wife would be serving, Sarvabhavanacharya would stand at the gate of his house with a stick. Actually, there's a painting of this scene in the Chaitanya Chatamrita, where it describes how Sarvabhavanacharya is standing with a stick and his wife is serving Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He would stand with a stick because he did not want his son-in-law to come in and see the elaborate feast that was being served to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. However, on one occasion, Sarvabhavacharya had to go to the kitchen to help his wife serve prasad to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So Amoga, he would always be standing with his ears against the wall. He would try and spy and see what are they talking. So if he could find some evidence against Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, then he could uh, defame him in society. So when he saw that for a minute there was no one at the gate, Amoga came in and he saw the various items of prasad that were cooked with love by Sarvaman Bhattacharya's wife for the pleasure of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So Amoga, as soon as he came in, he said, Look at this sannyasi. He pretends to be renounced, but see how much prasad he's eating. So Sarvaman Bhattacharya then chased him out of the house, actually ran behind him in the street, but he couldn't catch up to him. <laughs> so anyway, he escaped. So a few days later, Amoka was afflicted with a very serious, severe disease. Cholera, isn't it? Huh? He was afflicted with a severe disease of cholera. And he was about to die. The Gopinath Acharya, who was his uncle, had come to visit Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu just casually asked him how is Sarvamoha Acharya and how is Amoka. So he was informed that Amoga was on his deathbed, very, very sick, about to die. So then Chaitanya Mahaprabhu decided that he would go and see Amoga. Because Sarvabhama Acharya had become very dear to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu reasoned that if his daughter becomes a widow, then he may not get affected, he may not get disturbed. So it was more out of love for Sarvabhama Acharya that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu decided to visit Amoga on his deathbed. And when he visited Amoga on his deathbed, the Lord kept his hand on the chest of Sarvabhama, on the chest of Amoga, and he said, Why do you have envy in your heart? He said, As long as you have envy in your heart, as long as your heart is dirty, Krishna would not reside over there. So remove this envious nature. Remove this dirt from your heart. And as soon as he said that, Amoga was completely transformed. He jumped from his bed in ecstasy, fell at the feet of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and begged forgiveness for his offensive, envious attitude. So to be envious, of other Vaishnavas, spiritual master, supreme lord, is very, very dangerous for spiritual advancement. Therefore, we should completely uproot this envious tendency from our hearts. There's another story in this connection in uh, Chaitanya Chaitanya about a Brahmin who was very envious of the exalted position of Sri Vastaka. Because Lord Chaitanya was doing Kirtan in his house, the others, the Brahmins, have become envious how much honor that Sri was getting. So he made a plan by which he would defame Sri Vas. And what did he do? He kept all the paraphernalia for worshipping Goddess Durga in front of his house. So in the morning when Sri Vas got up and opened his door, 
he found a liquor bottle and all contaminated food that is normally offered to Goddess Durga. Of course, Shivas was a great devotee, so he had no problems. He said, he had, look, everyone come and see that I'm a devotee of Durga. But nobody would believe it. So later, everyone took cow dung, cow's urine, and they cleaned the whole place. Huh? A little later, this Brahmin was trying to defame this great devotee. So he got affected with leprosy. And he approached Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu refused to pardon him. He said, you should suffer even more. And again, so he suffered, suffered, suffered. Again, then after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took sannyas, he fell at his feet. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, I cannot forgive you. But if you go to my devotee, and then the devotee gladly forgave him. Now we see a similar pattern in the Srimad Bhagavatam also, in the famous encounter of the Rasa Muni and Amrish Maharaj. Isn't it? Very similar pattern. The Rasa Muni was also envious of the exalted position of Amrish Maharaj. And he was just waiting for an opportunity to strike at him. So when he thought he had the opportunity, actually he didn't have what he thought he had, he tried his best to burn Amrish Maharaj. And finally, Sarvasa Muni was able to even travel to the heavenly planets, reach the Vakula planets, but the Lord refused to pardon him. And ultimately he had to come back and fall at the feet of his of Amrish Maharaj, and then he was forgiven. So the point is this, that envy actually works against your endeavor to make spiritual advancement. So rather than being envious of each other, if you see that somebody is making spiritual advancement, we should gladly offer him obeisances and respect and ask him to please bless us so that we can also make spiritual advancement. And if you see that someone's making spiritual advancement, you should analyze well, how he's making spiritual advancement. And you will see that he's making spiritual advancement because of his strong determination and faith in the words of Guru Sadhu Shastra. And we should also get inspired by such examples so that we can also make spiritual advancement. Prabhupada used to call this spiritual competition. And Prabhupada used to give us the example of how spiritual competition exists in the spiritual world. Or you can call this spiritual envy. There's material envy which is destructive and the spiritual envy which is constructive. So spiritual envy inspires us to surrender more to the Lord, whereas material envy destroys your devotional creeper. So Prabhupada used to tell us how even amongst Lalit, even Lalita and Vishaka there is a spiritual competition, and even amongst uh, so most of all the devotees like Radharani and Chandravali, there is a spiritual competition. So envy should be destroyed. Then Kashyapi instructed his wife to always speak the truth. So truthfulness is also very, very important. Without truthfulness, you can't have any principles of religion. So truthfulness is one of the four essential ingredients of religion, isn't it? We must be truthful. That is why Prabhupada, when he published the Bhagavad Gita, he called it Bhagavad Gita as it is. He wanted the truthful message of the Bhagavad Gita to be presented, not the distorted version of the Bhagavad Gita. So truthfulness is practiced at many levels. First level is, accept Krishna the way Krishna wants you to understand him. Don't take Krishna and give your own interpretation of what Krishna should be. Accept Krishna the way Krishna wants you to understand. Accept Krishna the way exalted devotees like Parikshad Maharaj and Arjuna never accepted Krishna. Then next level of truthfulness is you be truthful to your vows of initiation. At the time of initiation or at the time we enter into the process of devotional service, we take on certain vows. I'll chant 16 rounds a day, I'll follow four regulative principles, I'll do this, I'll do that. So be truthful to those vows. Don't think, yes, I took those vows, but now I've become more advanced, so I have a different standard I'm going to apply. At that time I was neophyte. 
that was more simple. Now I understand things better, so I know what to follow or not to follow. So no, that is how Maya tricks you to become independent and destroy your spiritual people. So be truthful to the vows. And then be truthful in our dealings with each other. We should be truthful, truthful in our dealings. The truth should be spoken, but the truth should be spoken in a palatable way. This is the Vedic injunction. We don't compromise on the truth, but we present the truth in a palatable way. If we present the truth in a palatable way, Krishna will be on your side. And if Krishna is on your side, then you're guaranteed to be victorious, isn't it? Devotee doesn't rely on material strength. He relies on spiritual strength. Just like in the ninth canto, where there's a discussion about Lord Ramachandra's army and the attempt of Lord Ramachandra's army, um, how it was equipped to go and defeat Ravan's army. The Prabhupada in the purport talks about two types of strength, material and spiritual. Materially, Ravan's army was better equipped, but spiritually, uh, Ram's army was stronger because they had Lord Ram on their side. All they had was they knew how to throw stones and treetops. There were only two people in the army who knew how to shoot arrows, Ram and Lakshman. And on the other side, they had everything, all the technology, all the soldiers, etc. But they did not have, they did not have the blessings of the Lord. So when you are truthful, you should know that Krishna is on your side. And when you are untruthful, especially in dealing with Vaishnavas, then you should know that Krishna is not on your side. Whatever you may be saying. But it doesn't have Krishna's stamp of approval. And if something doesn't have Krishna's stamp of approval, then a devotee is not interested. Because one of the principles of surrender of the devotee is to only do what Krishna wants you to do. Just like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explains the six principles of Sharnagati or surrender. You save everything favorable for spiritual advancement and you reject everything unfavorable for spiritual advancement. So truthfulness is a factor that will help you to develop love of God. And uh, being untruthful will actually be a detrimental factor on the path of self-realization. So do not be scared of seeking the truth. Even if you've done a mistake, say, Prabhupada gives an example when teaching the Lord Kapila that once a teacher asked all the students in the class, go and find out who is your father and tell me who is your Pita. So the child came home, asked his mother. The mother said, son, if you want me to be honest, I do not know who your father is. So next day the child got up in the class and told the teacher. My mother said she doesn't know who my father is. The Prabhupada said, this is what it means to be truthful. That is speak the truth. Of course, when we go out preaching, we stick to the principle of truthfulness, but we present the truth in a more palatable, uh, sophisticated way. We don't go on the streets and tell people, dear animals, please listen to me. But we tell them in a nice way how uh, materialistic activities are very similar to the activities of the animals. Prabhupada wrote an essay once before he went to America called Truth and Beauty. So in an article Truth and Beauty, Prabhupada discusses this point. Truth has to be spoken. But how should it be spoken? And Prabhupada advises that truth must be spoken but spoken in a palatable way. So, Kashyapa is telling his wife, you must be non-envious and you must be truthful. Only then you will have a son that will be able to kill Indra. If you deviate a little bit also, you will not get a son who can kill Indra. Then he told, then he told uh, his wife, 
what you should eat, what you should not eat. He did not want his wife to eat food that, he, that was contaminated, meant to be offered to demigods. So it is very clear. Patram Puspa Palam Toyam. This is what is offered to Krishna. Then he tells his wife how she should behave. Just like we are discussing over here. How should she dress up? Huh? Prabhupada wrote this fur coat when the mini skirts were in fashion. Now the mini skirts have gone out of fashion. <laughs> in the material world, the fashion industry is such, it changes every year. Because then people are used to getting something new, isn't it? They change the fashion, they put one button on the right instead of the left, they call it this is the latest Pierre Cardin. Now there's a Pierre Cardin store <laughs> nearby. So that's one company that specializes you know, in just changing fashion and making fool out of people. So Prabhupada in the Purpa talks about how a woman should cover her body when she leaves home. These days in the material society the tendency is you expose your body so that you can attract the opposite sex, you can attract other people's attention. But Kashyapa Muni is advising his wife how when she leaves home she should be dressed, how she should be very, very brave, and she must cover her body properly. So Prabhupada, in the purport, he talks about this point that Kashyapa Muni very clearly told his wife how she should cover herself. And Prabhupada gives the example of the Oriental society. Specifically, the, the Muslim society, they're very strict, they cover their whole body just like uh, it is said in the scriptures. So that's something good. You connect your pandits and you take gold even from stool. So there's some good things you can learn every way. The way the Muslims also do namaz or the, uh, even in the airports, even in the planes you see when it's namaz time, go and do namaz. But our Hindus, they, they're so shy of chanting in the beads, you know, in public. If, if you put your hands like that, like our devotee Rishikesh Mahapadla was telling me the other recently, he said when he chants on the plane when he's traveling, people say, oh, what's wrong with your hand? You fractured your hand? <laughs> because he puts his hand inside the bead bag. He says, oh, what happened? You fractured your hand. Because the so-called concept of doing japa, is dead in this country, virtually, isn't it? You only see some old people in Vrindavan doing japa. You may see a lot of young pilgrims in Vrindavan, but you don't see them with japa mala, isn't it? Anybody ever do japa, they have one mala hanging on the wall in the temple room. They probably touch it once a year. No bead bag. They don't keep it in a sanctified way. They don't keep it clean, etc. So that sort of concept of being japa, etc., is almost dead. But among the Muslims, they don't feel embarrassed. I have flown with Muslims on the plane all over the world. I've been with them at the airports. When it's the mass time, they crash out in front of everyone. They don't get scared. So that discipline is good. And even Prabhupada appreciated it. I heard a lecture from him in Montreal in which Prabhupada very much praised this the, this tendency that they had, the Muslims had. So, Kashyapa Muni is advising how the women folk should get up and should dress themselves and how they should dress themselves properly and cover their whole body. The Vedic system is not a system of sense enjoyment. Material society is a society of sense enjoyment where he is trying to attract she, she is trying to attract he. But a Vedic society is a more civilized society. Therefore, Prabhupada, in, in the concluding lines of the purport, says, if one takes the Krishna consciousness, one is fully purified, and thus one remains always transcendental to the contamination of the material world. So material world is actually a very contaminated place. Wherever you look, you see nothing but contamination, isn't it? Isn't that what Shukadev Goswami said? Kale do se nete rajan. He said, my dear king, there is nothing but dosh everywhere. Isn't it? Till a certain point India was a little protected. But now, 
India is as exposed to corrupt materialistic society as any Western country. In fact, I would say it's more exposed. You see more cigarette and liquor advertising in India than you see in the West, isn't it? Much more, fifty times more. So people, wherever you see, there's those. There's an endeavor for sense enjoyment. So the only solution is Krishna consciousness. Parikshit Maharaj was advised. There's only one benediction in this age, in this age where everywhere there's nothing but contamination. And what is that benediction? The holy name of the Lord. So similarly, Papa is explaining how actually in the material world is nothing but a big place of contamination. But the only solution is Krishna consciousness. Papa says, unless one takes the Krishna consciousness, one will get contaminated. Bhagavad Gita gives us the example how the lotus flower is in water, but it doesn't get touched by the water. And Prabhupada gives an example, the famous example of the rat and the mouse and the and the, and the, the kitten. How the, how the cat is holding the kitten very carefully. And the kitten is feeling full protection in the mouth of the mother, isn't it? But the rat feels, feels sees death when he sees the mouth of the cat. So similarly for the devotee, because he knows how to use the material energy in service to Krishna. Because he's not making an independent decision of how to use the material energy, but rather going by Guru, Sadhu and Shastra. Material energy doesn't protect him, doesn't touch him. Just like Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, lotus flowers in water, but the water doesn't touch the lotus flower. Where are the materialist? He has no one guiding him. The Guru is not guiding him, the Sadhu is not guiding him, the Shastras are not guiding him. And who is guiding him? His uncontrolled senses, mind and intelligence. And because the uncontrolled senses, mind and intelligence are guiding him, his intelligence is directed just to achieve this one target, which is more and more sense enjoyment. That's all, nothing beyond that. So we have to become Krishna conscious and we have to make others Krishna conscious. Prabhupada used to say, a devotee must understand beyond doubt that this material world is no place for a gentleman. If you want to be a gentleman or gentlewoman, then you must understand in this material world, there's no place to make a permanent arrangement. Therefore, we should accept only what is necessary to keep body and soul together. We should endeavor only to earn as much as is necessary to keep body and soul together. And the rest of the time should be used for what? For practicing Krishna consciousness. This is known as simple living high thinking. We should take advantage of this rare opportunity that has been realized after millions of births and deaths to become Krishna conscious. Now when you try to become Krishna conscious, it is a natural desire that you also want to make others Krishna conscious. Because as we have explained many times, a devotee is not selfish in nature. A devotee is magnanimous in nature. And the magnanimity of a devotee is revealed in the devotee's endeavor to make others Krishna conscious of. We can't be Krishna conscious and say, let everyone else go to hell. I have the formula. Material society means you become rich, let everyone remain poor. You don't care. But spiritual consciousness means you are becoming spiritually rich and you want others to also become spiritually rich. You want to give the secret to everyone. Did the Acharyas hide anything from us? They have declared everything in their purport. Did Prabhupada hide anything from us? No. He wrote everything in his purport. Therefore, the endeavor of every devotee should be how he can become Krishna conscious and how he can make others Krishna conscious. Therefore, we have this program of preaching. Therefore, we have this program of book distribution so that we can make others Krishna conscious also. Like few days ago when I gave the class, I read to you devotees 
the two verses from the 18th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. In those two verses, what does Krishna say? One who preaches my glories, devotional service is guaranteed. And he becomes very dear to me. So now we are all engaged in this Prabhupada marathon, huh? Hare Krishna. Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Krishna Krishna Hare Hare